Thank you, praise team. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 2 this morning. Ephesians chapter 2. So you'll want to turn there. That video you saw earlier, that was base camp last year. We're just trying to get everybody excited for base camp this year. Next month on the 15th, Jonathan and Nora will be here, and Jonathan will be preaching. Also, um, Chris and Ginny Cram from Pine Valley Bible Conference Center will also be here, and they're going to be presenting base camp to us. And so we're getting excited and, and getting geared up for that. Notice Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and preached to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole world, the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also being built up together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Father, again, we thank you so much. We ask your blessing Upon your word, in Christ's name we pray, amen. And you may be seated. You know, as I thought about what's contained in this passage before us, I realized just how lost mankind would be without God's revelation to us, which is in your lap, actually. That's an exciting thought when you think about it, God's revelation to us in your lap, If you're holding the Bible in your lap, those 66 books we call the Bible. Without it, mankind would be groping in spiritual darkness. Uh, Without hope, without direction, without faith, without peace. Separated from God, never knowing how to find Him. Had the Lord never revealed Himself to man, had He not done that through His spoken word and then later the written word, our separation from Him, separation that man kind has from God would be incredibly vast and unreachable. We could not get to God. The Old Testament patriarch, Jacob, he had a dream of a of a great ladder. You may may remember that from the Old Testament, a staircase that spanned the distance between heaven and earth, showing the great separate separation between God and man. How that staircase was the only way to bridge the separation between God and man. At that time, particularly Israel. That staircase, of course, represented the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that, looking back. Who's the only one that bridges the separation of sinful man to God? To God the Father, the Holy God. And the dream that the Lord gave to Jacob was one of many ways that he revealed himself and his plan to save mankind. A plan that would bring sinful man and sinless God together. And had he not done this, had he not revealed himself to us, he would no doubt still be in darkness and, and many perhaps feeling the separation between them and God. This is how I felt as a youth. I was thinking about this. I remember as a child, as a young man, a junior higher and a high schooler, even... Um, after I graduated, I, I could sense this separation. Even though I I'd had a, you know, a religion that I was raised in, a family religion, I felt this separation between God and man. I, I was a good practicer of the religion, but it was still this separation that I felt before my encounter with God's Word. I, I felt separated from Him. 
I knew there was a God because of the way I had been raised. I understood that. I knew there was a God in heaven. But I felt separated from him, unable to get to him. You may remember that. And not really knowing him, knowing of him, but not really knowing him in a personal way. He seemed to be distant and unconcerned. And, and there, 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 he was there, and, and I was here, and there was, seemed to be this great gulf between us. And, and to me, the Lord seemed unreachable. He wasn't a personal God to me as he is today. I, I know him personally. And he knows me. And it wasn't until he revealed himself to me from his word or through his word. It wasn't until I came into direct contact with the word of God that I, I came into a personal faith with the Lord Jesus Christ, through the Lord Jesus Christ, to the Father. First, by those who carried it in their hearts. I remember there were those who, who had the word of God. They had hidden it in their heart. And they, they carried it in their heart and they shared it with me. And then later, when I got a copy of the word of God and began to read it for myself, I discovered that this great separation between me and God could be done away with. And both worked as a revelation. Those who, who preached to me and uh, shared the word with me and the word of God itself. Both worked as a revelation that opened my eyes and ears, softening my heart and transforming my mind, changing me from the inside out. And I remember the day when it all came together, when the darkness was replaced, replaced with brilliant light and and when falsehood and lies of the world were replaced with the truth, with the truth, when the separation because of my sin was given over to, the close, to closeness and unity to the Father through his Son, when all that he had done for me became real and personal. I remember that. And when Paul, if you notice there, Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 in, in uh, verse 18 when he says, I, I gained or I gain access through him, the Lord Jesus Christ, one in spirit or in one spirit, the Holy, Holy Spirit, to the Father. Um, from that moment on, I was united with the triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, they are one and now we, they and I, are one. They and I are one. And what I've just laid out before you is a process that God has used over and over again. You know, the, the Lord originally revealed himself to his first creation, Adam. If you're familiar with that, if you read the Old Testament, if you read Genesis, you know that in Genesis God planted Adam in the Garden of Eden and, and there he spoke to him. He spoke to him. Given Adam specific instructions on how things were to be in the garden and later God would would speak to others, revealing his plan to them as well. He would speak to Abraham, promising him that through Abraham, God would make a great nation, the nation of Israel. One that would follow God's laws and commandments. They would be known as the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. And only through them, God would speak. And only through them was redemption found. That was God's plan. And as, unless someone was converted to Judaism and believed in the God of the Jews, that separation that we talked about just a moment ago remained. They stood outside of God's revealed plan. They stood outside of God's revelation. Anyone other than the nation of Israel. In the Old Testament, the only way to draw close to God was by faith in the God of the Jews, expressed in obedience to his laws and commands. It's the only way you could draw close to God and the practicing of the sacrificial system that God gave to Moses was God's plan. There were some non-Jews, if you remember, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, there were some, some non-Jews as recorded in the New Testament, like Ruth, the wife of Boaz, and Rahab the harlot, who came to personal faith in the God of Israel, in the Lord. And through, through that, converted to Judaism, I, I wanted to quote uh, Ruth to her mother-in-law, Naomi, if, you, if you're familiar at all with the book of Ruth. Um... You remember that uh, Ruth and her husband left the land of Israel and went into a foreign land, and um, uh, I meant uh, Naomi. Um, they, they left and went into a foreign land, and Naomi lost her husband and her two sons, and she just had her daughter-in-laws, and one of the daughter-in-laws decided to stay when Naomi decided to go back to the land of Israel, but Ruth clung to her and loved her and didn't want to leave her. 
And she said this. She said, do not urge me to leave you or to turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. That's a conversion. That's a conversion. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me a worse, if anything, but death parts you and I. But that was a rare occasion in the Old Testament. You didn't see that very often. You didn't see Gentiles, un, non-Jews, coming to faith as, as you do here. It was rare. I mean, there are a handful of them. There are some records, but across the board, the vast population of Gentiles in the Old Testament, very few came to faith in, in the Lord. Unless you were born a Jew or exposed to God's revelation, by divine providence and converted to Judaism, you had no hope of ever bridging the gap, ever. That separation between God and man. I, I cherish the revelation of God for that reason. I do. I cherish it. It was God's revelation that brought me to him. And so you, you had no hope of ever bridging the gap of separation between God and mankind, not until Christ came and started a new dispensation a new system of order, if you will, a new covenant, as he proclaimed. One unlike the old covenant, but built on its foundations, most definitely. One that not only included Jews, but non-Jews as well. That's the exciting thing that Paul's talking about in the passage that we're looking at here. So you didn't have to be a Jew anymore to bridge the gap. You didn't have to be a Jew anymore to, to know God in a personal way. So that anyone who comes to Christ alone in faith alone would find him sufficient to bridge the gap of separation and gain direct access to the Father. And this is where the passage we have at hand is coming from. If you'll notice there, uh, Ephesians 2 verse 18 is, the, is actually the center of the passage that we're looking at this morning. Who I am in Christ, I have direct access to the Father through him. That's, that's where we're at this morning in our series on who I am in Christ. He says, through him we have... We both have our access in one spirit to the Father. And when Paul says our, he's graciously including the non-Jewish believers. That's what he's doing. Paul's a Jew, a Roman, but a Jew. And he's graciously including the non-Jewish believers that made up the church in Ephesus. You know, Ephesus was a Roman city. You may not have known that, but it was a Roman city. Romans were pre predominantly Gentile and non-Jewish. Some Jews were able to... Uh, obtain Roman citizen, citizenship either by uh, purchasing it, which was illegal. You really couldn't purchase Roman um, citizenship. I mean, people did, but it wasn't really allowed by Rome. But people did it you know, through a crooked government. They could do that. Or you had to be born into Roman citizenship. And, and we see both of those in Acts chapter 22. If you want to turn there, you can. You can turn later. We're not going to go there. Or there was another way you could get Roman citizenship, and that was... Rome offered Roman citizenship through military service as a Roman soldier, but that was a 25-year commitment. But that was, that was how coveted Roman citizenship was in the first century. Everybody wanted to be a, Rome, wanted to be a Roman, Roman citizen. And so they would even willing to serve 25 years in the military as a soldier, a foot soldier, of course, um, opposed to a cavalry soldier, a foot soldier to begin with, for 25 years to have Roman citizenship. So Ephesus... The capital city of Asia Minor was a Gentile city, predominantly non-believers, non-Jewish. And it's from this Gentile, non-Jewish heritage perspective that Paul writes to them. And so the Ephesians were not Jews, but Gentiles. More specifically, they were not Jewish converts to Christianity, but Gentile converts to Christianity. That's what they were. However, rather you were Jewish or Gentile, you still had to forsake your religion in order to become a Christian. If a Jew, then Judaism, which is what Paul espoused in several of his epistles, severing of the Jewish religion to Christianity, or if you were a Roman, then you had to break away from paganism, which was deeply rooted in Roman culture. Paganism. We see that carrying over into the Corinthian church. The paganism carried into, the, into their worship practices in the Corinthian church and Paul wrote the book, first book of Corinth uh, correcting all that all that deep seated paganism that they brought into the church now in the passage at hand Ephesians 2 
11 through 22, Paul is straining out some of, or some theological confusion, or at least it reads that way. It reads that way to me. Maybe he's affirming sound theological truth. I think it's both. He's correcting and he's affirming at the same time. I believe he is. And he can do that, right? He has that prerogative. And the context concerns rather or not the Ephesians, being Gentiles, truly have direct access to the Father. Because they're not Jews. That's the argument. It's, it's obvious, obviously that someone or a group of someones, most likely Jewish converts to Christianity, or maybe false Jewish converts to Christianity, they're not really true converts to Christianity. They've said that they didn't have access because they're not of Jewish descent. Now, because Rome had conquered the majority of the civilized world at that time, which included the land of Israel, the people of Israel really didn't look favorably on the Romans or anyone that was associated with them. They hated them. They hated the Romans. This included vehemently hatred for their pagan religion. The Jews hated the Roman religion terribly. It was an assault against their, their pure faith of, of the true God. Romans had many gods, and they were making gods all the time. But Israel had one God, the one and true living God. And then this Christianity came along out of Judaism, through Judaism. So it was a slap to the Jewish face and their Jewish heritage when a Roman, an Ephesian, professed Jesus Christ as Lord thus claiming to possess all the rights and privileges that come with that, notwithstanding the spiritual inheritance, uh, spiritual inheritance or riches in Christ that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 1 and chapter 2, which included but wasn't limited to direct access to the Father through the Son in the Holy Spirit. You see, there was some false teaching that said that you had to be a Jew before you could be a Christian. That's what they were thinking at that particular time, separating Gentiles away from Christianity and away from God. There's no way, you know, if, if Christianity was a pure, pure religion and it came out of Judaism, you definitely can't be one if you're a Gentile unless you convert to, convert to Judaism first. So they could never be Christian because they were never Jewish. Or at the very least, they would, were expected to convert to Judaism in order to become a Christian. Something like that. And those of that sect were called Judaizers what they were called. They made it their duty to make sure that any Jewish Christian continued to follow the old ways of Judaism and and they were confusing the Christian Jews. That's what they were doing. And as a result, some of the Jewish converts to Christianity were expecting the Gentile converts to Christianity to adhere to all the Jewish rites and ceremonies, which included keeping the dietary laws, the ceremonial laws, Sabbath worship and circumcision. Not only that, but because they were Gentile, not Jewish, they had no hope of ever entering into the holy place, which was the center of the Jewish worship. Thus, they were without access to God. That's what's happening in the passage there. The Jews ceremonially were able to enter into the presence of God only partially as a nation, you know, as a whole, within the Jewish sacrificial system and their temple worship. Now, I don't know if you know this, but the temple consisted of three parts. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. I'm just going to give it to you briefly. There's a lot involved in the, in the temple worship and the ceremonial temple worship. A lot involved. And you would do yourself very good to go and study that out. I have, I have some literature that would help you do that. I have some study tools that would help you do that. But the temple consist, consisted of three parts. The outer court where Gentiles were welcome. Gentiles could come in. If they, if they were hoping to draw in any way, shape, or form, they, they could. It was somewhat acceptable. The outer court there, and then the inner court, were only, where only ceremonial clean, cleansed Jews could go. They had to be ceremonial clean in order to go in the outer court. And this was as close as they could get to God. And then the Holy of Holies, where only the ceremonial clean, cleansed priests could go. And only once a year. Now, If you're familiar with the Old Testament, if you're familiar with the tabernacle before the temple, if you remember God's presence existed in the tabernacle and in the temple. He existed in a manifestation of a pillar of cloud by day. He would extend out of that 
And you've seen those smoke plumes here in the valley when they're burning fields, right? They're brilliant white and they go straight up like a funnel. And every time I see those, I think of that. Maybe that's what it looked like. Because the whole encampment could see it. And then at night, a pillar of fire. The presence of God. And the Holy Holies was behind, a, was behind a curtain. There was an opening and there was a curtain. And the priest would enter in once a year. Go through the curtain. And he had to be a long, drawn-out ceremonial process in order for him to go in before he could go in. And I've told you before that they had a rope attached to him and a bell. And if he went in unworthy in any way, he'd be struck immediately dead by the presence of God. They wouldn't hear the, hear the bell anymore. They figured he'd drop dead, so they'd pull him out. And then the next priest would go in, right? Into the presence of God. This was the sacrificial system. And I, I've given you just a tiny little portion of it. Really, it was quite complex and very detailed, to say the least. And the Jews, they, they prided themselves in the ability to go before the presence of God. Only the Jews had this sacrificial system. Only the Jews, only the priests. Only the Jews can go into the inner court and only the priests can go into the Holy of Holies. This was a, a solemn um, endeavor. It was, just, it was an awesome thing for the Jewish people. Only the Jews had this. The pagan nations, the Gentile nations, were apart from God. They were, except for those few converts that I spoke of. Now, in the new dispensation, that, ha that has been done away with. And Christians, all Christians, have direct access to God through Jesus Christ. Verse 18, Ephesians chapter 2. The old system is obsolete and replaced with the new. As I told you, the veil of the temple, the veil of the temple here. At Christ's death, the scripture tells us, was torn in two. It was one, one complete woven veil. I imagine the priest would enter this way. But at the death of Christ, it was torn from top to bottom. Not from bottom to top, but from top to bottom, signifying that the hand of God had miraculously intervened and tore that separation down. Tore it down. Opened up the Holy of Holies. Opened up the presence of God all who would come who had been made clean by the blood of Christ. And so the, the old system is obsolete and replaced by the new. But Jewish converts or so-called ones, possibly Judaizers, probably Judaizers, were saying that the old system still remained. They didn't want to let go of that, all that. Works and works and works and rituals and rituals and rituals, a way to try to earn your way into the presence of God. And that's what Paul is refuting in epistle after epistle. Paul was the apostle of grace. And they were saying that the Gentiles had no access to God, Christian or not. First, because of the Jews' deep spiritual and religious roots that I just briefly explained to you. And second, most likely because of their disdain for the Gentile people, particularly Romans. They couldn't swallow the fact that Romans could come before God. So the Apostle Paul, a Jewish convert to Christianity, Acts 9, and a Roman citizen by birth, Acts 22, from Judaism to Christianity, set out to clear up the whole matter now, with all this in mind, the passage at hand begins to make sense. That's why I give you that historical background there, Old Testament background. It starts to make sense. So notice with me, and I'll, I'll explain it as we go along, but let's start with verse 11. And the, whole pa the passage that we read starts to become very clear, giving that, that historical background, the Old Testament background. It starts to make a lot more sense. Notice what he says in verse 11. Therefore, remember that you formerly, remember he's talking to the Gentiles here, and he says it, that you formerly, the Gentiles in the flesh, and he says what he means there, who are, uncircum who are called the uncircumcision. That was a, uh, that was a bad word, okay? That was a, kind of a, a, a mark against the Gentile. The Jews, the sanctimonious Jews, the pious Jews would call the Gentiles not only dogs, but uncircumcision. Reminding everyone that they were separated from God. And he says that, so-called, by the so-called circumcision. 
That's sarcasm there, and he's probably saying those, those who say they are, but are really are not. They're not genuine in heart. They really don't even believe the God of Israel. They're not in a love relationship with him. They're in, they're in love with their system. They're in love with their religion. They're not in love with, the, with God. And so he's using sarcasm there. It says, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. You know what I'm talking about, right? You know what Paul's talking about there. Circumcision. Okay, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So what's happening in verse 11? Well, Paul affirms the Gentiles' past separation from Christ. He's saying, yes, you were separated from Christ. Yes, you were separated from God. That is a true fact. Even from those who call themselves the circumcised. They're right in that way. First, before Christ came and changed things, and second, before their conversion to Christianity. And before Christ came and changed things, Paul refers to their separation in the context of circumcision. Circumcision was the physical mark that God gave to the Jews that separated them from the rest of the world and united or, or linked them with God. It was that mark on the flesh that said, you are God's people. You are God's people. Circumcision said to the pagan world that the Jews belong to the living God and every male child, the age of eight, remember even Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day, received that mark. And it was a ceremonial rite that identified them with God, more specifically the God of heaven, the living God. And no other. No other. And the Gentiles didn't have this mark. The Romans didn't circumcise, nor did any other Gentile nation at that time. Only the Jews. So in their uncircumcision, they were separated away from God or from Christ, from the Jewish nation, if you will, verse 11. And thus, verse 12 says, they were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. In other words, I want to put this in its basic form, okay? You try to understand this. When he talks about being excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, he's talking about being excluded from a nation that was un under the blessing of God. The nation of Israel. One nation under God. Sound familiar? What blessed America was its core belief in Christianity. Thus, they were one nation. Thus, we were one nation under God. And I say were, for a good reason. And so because they were not Jews, they were excluded from the benefits that would come from being a nation under God. That common wealth that he's talking about there. That common blessing that God had over Israel because they were his and he was theirs. And there's a blessing that comes with that. Also because of this, they were strangers to the covenants of promise. You know, God made promises to Israel and only to Israel. The promises that God made to Israel, he didn't make to the church. Let's, we probably ought to get that straight, right? Pastor Paul, we need to get that straight, right? A lot of people out there believing that the church replaced Israel in that context, but two different dispensations, two different plans. Very clear in my Bible. So God made many promises to Israel and only to Israel, which included both promises in this life and, and the next, both physical and spiritual. However, because the Gentiles were excluded from, from all Jewish um, blessings, they were left with having no hope, as it says there, and without God in the world. In other words, no divine revelation. They had no divine revelation. God was not speaking to the Gentiles. He was speaking only to the Jew. And if he spoke to the Gentile, he was doing it through the Jewish nation. Either in written form or in prophets. So God did send Jonah to Nineveh. So that was an incredible act of God's mercy on the part of pagan Nineveh. So without that revelation, without either written form or, pro or, for or from the prophets, the Gentile nations had no hope, as Paul said, having no hope and without God in the world. And this was true for all Gentiles before Christ, except for a few exceptions. And this takes us to verse 13 through 17, where Paul starts with verse 13, and a colossal change in direction. Do you see it there? He speaks of the old in verse 11 and 12, now he speaks of the new from 13 to the end of the chapter, which has opened the spiritual door for Gentiles to be saved. Amen? Now have access to God. And I'm going to try to summarize it, okay, up to verse 17. Because we're going to get back to Ephesians. Remember we started Ephesians a year ago or so? We were preaching through it, barely got through chapter 1, and then we took off on a different, went on another tangent, right? 
We'll get back to that once we get through this series, Who I Am in Christ. And then when we finish Ephesians, we're going to get back to Mark because we left Mark too. That ought to get us about 15 years down the road from now, right? In verse 13, Paul says that they were separated from Christ or far off and have been brought near or now able to come to Christ. How? By his blood. This is great news for the Gentiles. Great news. And here Paul speaks of the only way of salvation, both for Jews and Gentiles. That is, the, a blood sacrifice. That's the only way of salvation. We know that to be true. From Genesis to the end of the book, and everywhere in between, right? It's got to be a blood sacrifice. That's what the cross is all about. And in context, it has to be a perfect blood sacrifice. And when did the blood sacrifice take place? Well, Paul says it, right? When Jesus Christ sacrificed who? Who? Himself, in verse 16, on the cross, God in human form, second member of the Trinity, the Son of God, came, became a man and sacrificed himself on the cross. Remember that. He showed us in the Gospels that he did it himself. They didn't forcibly take him as they think he did because one of the Gospels shows us that when the soldiers came, the Lord just wiped them, knocked them all down <laughs> like dominoes. He relinquish himself to them. And Paul affirms it here in this passage of Scripture. He sacrificed himself on the cross. And then in verse 14 through 17, he explains just what Christ's sacrifice accomplished. Primarily, Paul says that because of Christ's work on the cross, the Jews and the Gentiles are now on equal ground. This is what he's saying. It's revolutionary for both the Jews and the Gentiles. There is no spiritual wall of separation anymore. They both have open access to God. In fact, they are one in salvation, one in Christ. As he says in verse 14, For he himself is our peace. That's peace between the Jews and Gentiles now. Our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of dividing wall. That dividing wall was the one that separated Jews and Gentiles in the temple. I told you about that. You know, there was an outer court, an inner court. There was a wall between them. which also kept the Gentiles away from God. But it had a spiritual counterpart to it, that wall. It had a spiritual counterpart to it because the Gentiles had no representation to go before God. They didn't. The Gentiles had no representation to go before God for them, like the Jewish priests. And the wall reminded, of them, reminded them of that. You, you're Gentiles. You cannot get to God. You have no priests for you. No mediators or no intercessors for you. But Christ's coming has now made peace between them and us, Jews and Gentiles, and has broken down that barrier. In verse 15, Jesus did this by abolishing in his flesh. In other words, the crucifixion on the cross, the enmity in that passage there, or the barrier between Jews and Gentiles. And Paul tells us what it has been. It's, it's the ceremonial law and the sacrificial system which is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, as he says there. This is a reference to the ceremonial laws, so that in him, Jesus, he might make two into one new man, thus establishing peace. And so Christ's coming has taken away the need for ceremony as a means to getting close to God. We don't have to do any kind of ceremony anymore. Aren't you glad? It tells us that we need not practice as the Jewish or the Jews did in the Old Testament. The ceremonial laws, the dietary laws. Now, you remember in Acts, Peter got that vision of the, the giant sheet that was opened up and there was all kinds of animals and the Lord said, kill Peter and eat. And Lord said, and Peter said, oh no, Lord, I've never ate anything unclean. The Lord says, what I have made clean, don't call it unclean. And then he was sent to Simon the Tanner, which was considered a very unclean form of employment to handle dead animals. Now it was okay. It's all being opened up. The old ceremonies, the old way to God. There's a lot more to it. Paul's really summarizing here. And so Christ's coming has taken away the need for ceremony as a means to getting close to God. That tells us that we don't have to practice as the Jews did, the ceremonial laws, the dietary laws, the keeping of the Sabbath, circumcision as a means of spirituality. They were only symbols of things to come, and he has now come. That's Paul's point. 
The moral law still applies. I kind of had to add that there, okay? The moral laws still apply, of course. But there shouldn't be this enmity or barrier anymore. Now, we can come together as one in Christ. Not Jews, not Gentiles, but Christians. That's Paul's point. Christians, we're all one in Christ. Whether you're a Gentile. That's why when Brother Irv comes, my Jewish friend, I love that guy, isn't he funny? He's typically a Jewish man. His, his jokes are Jewish. I don't always get them, but he gets them, so I guess that's all that matters, right? He's such a funny guy, a little tiny Jewish guy. We're brothers. We're in Christ, both of us. We are. Nothing separates us, nothing. Christ brings us together, as it says, so that in himself he might make the two. Let's just use my brother Irvin, me. Thus two, one man, thus establishing peace between us. Christ does this. And that takes us to verse 16 and 17. We're almost done. And might reconcile them both, he means Jews and Gentiles, in one body to God through the cross by it having put to death the enmity. That's the religious separation between Jews and Gentiles. And he came and he preached peace to you. He's talking about the Gentiles here who are far off. They are far away. The Gentiles are far away from God. And then peace to those who were near. They were far away, the Gentiles, and the, the Jews near to God. And then there's a twist there in verse 16. I don't know if you saw it or not, but I did in my study. I thought, hey, wait a minute. Something neat happening in that passage. Because Paul includes the Jews with the Gentiles being reconciled or brought close to God. You see that? What's he saying? Well, although the Jews had all the ceremonial systems that included many rules and regulations and ceremonies, they were still not as close to God as they could get. Christ had to come. Until Christ came and worked his work on the cross, making the Jews and the Gentiles one in Christ. So Christ opened the door for all to be saved. So the Jews, just like the Gentiles, really had no full access or direct direct to God, you know, full access or direct access to God until Christ came. And did away with the need for a priestly blood sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins, if you will, for atonement for sin. All the laws made up of ceremony, rules, regulations didn't get them any closer to God in all actuality. The Jews needed Jesus Christ. They needed Christ. That's why we have Messianic Jews. That's why we have born-again Jews. That's why we have Brother Irv and his wife Cordelia. And that's why his mission is to go to Jews and tell them that they need Christ. Their religious system is not enough. So the Jews need Christ just like we do if they're going to draw near to God. And this is why Paul says what he says the way he says it in verse 18. And that takes us not only to the core of this morning's message, who I am in Christ, I have direct access to the Father through him, but it also takes us to the end of our message this morning. I know you feel really bad about that. Right? You guys don't know if you should say yes or amen or something, huh? Notice verse 18. For through him, that is Jesus Christ, and his work of redemption on the cross, verse 16, we both, Paul says, Jews and Gentiles, have our access. That is personal access. We do not need a priest anymore. The book of Hebrews makes that very clear. Many chapters making that very clear. Not only that, but because it's personal, we can bring all our needs, both spiritual and material, directly to God. Our is personal. We have our access. It's personal. In one spirit. First, first of all, Paul's talking about that there's only one Holy Spirit, right? There's not a Holy Spirit for the Jews and one for the Gentiles. There's not. As we are one in Christ, we are one in spirit. Secondly, Paul emphasizes the Trinity in this verse, which is a key theological point. The Trinity. They're all there, right? You see them there. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. They're all there. Thirdly, he's saying that we have the whole of the Trinity at our disposal when he puts them together like that. As we seek access to God, they're all there. They're all involved. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're all, they're all there and we're able to enter into the triune Godhead. That's amazing. As we can see, all are involved when it comes to our access to them. We have the fullness of the Godhead's uh, attention, if you will. We have the fullness of the Godhead's attention when we approach God. Fourthly, the word 
Access is key here. It's only used three times in the New Testament, the word access here in the Greek. Although Christ is the reason or the source of our access to the Father, I mean, he made it possible. He opened the door. It was at his death that the veil was torn. He made it possible. So although Christ is the reason of our source or the source of our access to the Father, it's our union with the Holy Spirit that makes it possible. Without the Holy Spirit, we could not go before God. If we didn't have the Holy Spirit, we'd have no access. Because He is in us, it is through Him that we have access to the Father. You know, the word access describes, in, in, it's, it's kind of described this way in the, in a, if you were looking up in, in a Greek definition, it would, it would be this way. It describes a court official who, who introduces people to the king. That's the word access there, and it's in reference to the Holy Spirit Himself. That's what Paul means. The Holy Spirit plays this role when we go before the Lord in prayer. So now since Christ has come, everyone who comes to Christ for salvation, seeking forgiveness of their sin, and remember you can't get that from a man. A man can't forgive your sins. We don't need the holy priesthood anymore. That's been done away with. We have a prophet, priest, and king. His name is Jesus. So now since Christ has come, everyone who comes to Christ for salvation seeking forgiveness of sin, gets free passage to the Father at any time. At any time. At all times. We don't need a priest. We don't need Old Testament Jewish sacrificial systems. We have the Holy Spirit. Amen? We don't need angels. We don't need priests. We don't need rituals. We don't need sacrifices, sacraments, anything. All that is not necessary, according to the Apostle Paul. We have Christ. We have the triune Godhead at our disposal. This is who I am in Christ. It's a glorious truth. It is a glorious truth. You want to be happy this week? You get a hold of that. Stop thinking about yourself and how woe is me, how terrible I feel, and get a hold of that. And you'll shout it on the rooftop. It's a glorious truth. Now, before we go, I want to take a quick look at some verses that speak to this end, and then I'll let you go, maybe. Notice chapter 2, verse 13. We've already read it, but I wanted to read it again. It says, but now. This is that transition that Paul makes here from the old to the new. But now. Something's changed, okay? But now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were afar off have been brought near. How? By the blood of Christ. That's all we need. Jesus' blood is sufficient. We need nothing more. Ephesians 3.12. Check that out. In him we, again, Paul's talking about not only a Roman citizen, but a Jew, and he's, he's speaking to Gentiles, so he means the whole lot. Christian Jews and Christian Gentiles as one, as he's already said, in, him, in whom we have boldness, and confident access through faith in Him. It's the only thing that keeps us away from God is saving faith. That's it. That's it. Saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as our only access to God. Faith in Jesus Christ alone. Nothing else. No rituals, no ceremonies, no traditions. Only Christ. And then if you'll go over to Hebrews chapter 4 with me. You turn there real quick. Hebrews chapter 4. This kind of nails down the whole thing. It's one of my favorite. I know, I tell you, I got a lot of favorites. I've been in the Bible. I've been studying the Bible for over 20 years. That's why. When you do it that much that long, you start to have a lot of favorites, right? That's what the youth tell me when I'll tell one of them, you know, you're, one, you're my favorite. And they'll say, we're all your favorites, Pastor. Right? That's true. They're all my favorites. Hebrews 4.16 Therefore, let us draw near with confidence. I like that. That's a qualifying word there. With confidence. We have nothing to fear when we draw close to God. We have all the confidence in the world that we know we're going to enter into the presence of God. He's going to hear us. He's going to answer us. Amen? Take confidence. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. That's why we're able to go. It's the throne of grace. It's not the throne of works. It's the throne of grace. Unconditional pardon. 
so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When Paul's, I don't know about Paul, a lot of people think it's Paul. I want to say Paul. I don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews, but whoever wrote it, he's given that Jewish perspective there because he's writing to Jews. And he's using Old Testament language to bring a New Testament truth. That the throne now is free and access. It's open now. It's open by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Amen? So what is it that I have in Christ, being a Christian? I have direct access to the Father by the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. We don't have to be groping in darkness without answers and without hope or help at all, without direction. We have a perfect person to take all our needs to for help. And we can go there boldly because Christ has made the way. Amen? So if, you're, if you are without hope in life today, if somehow your religion has, has left you separated from God and you've always wondered why I just can't get close to God, this is the reason. You're holding to a process, not a person. Not a person. You must trust in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the uh, profound truth Profound truth, maybe convicting truth, maybe illuminating truth, most definitely eye-opening truth. Thank you for the confidence we have in your word as Gentiles, as non-Jews, and yet we are just as close to you in Christ, maybe even closer because we're in Christ. Maybe there's somebody here today who can resonate with this and say, yeah, it's, it's, I never really seem to just, I never, I never can really seem to reach God totally. You've got to come to him by faith alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Everything else has to be set aside. Paul called the Jews away from their ceremony called them away from what had been a national religion to a relationship in Jesus Christ. Do away, from, we'll do away from those religious practices and just come to Christ alone. You can do that today. If you're here today, just recognize that you're a sinner. The Holy Spirit can do that. He does do that. He opens your eyes to who you are, separated from God, not fully near him. Repent, ask him to forgive you, and then accept him by faith. By faith alone. I come to you alone, Christ. And if that is your desire, just right where you're at, just make that known to God, just you and him. I desire to come to you by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. I uh, surrender all attachments to other religious things and only turn to Christ. If you're making that decision today, I'd like you to let me know. Either by raise of hand or come to me personally at the end of the service and say, I prayed that prayer today. I have some literature I'd like to give you. Father, thank you so much for the presence of your Holy Spirit, for the power of your word through the Holy Spirit, and the amazing truth we have in this living word of God that speaks to the believer in such a direct way, in such a personal way. Thank you for the confidence we have in your word as we make it first and foremost in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you all please rise for the final song? <laughs>